Hi, I am Dr. Sophia Grant. Welcome to the Two Soka podcast, Two Sisters of a Certain Age, Conversations with a Therapist and a Doctor. With me, I have my sister, Judy Grant. Hello, everybody. It's nice to be here again. Today, we're going to be talking about what led us to our careers. Judy, why don't you get started? We felt it was important that as you get to know us, that you understand what brought us to the places where we are today, both personally and professionally. And so we want to focus on that professional piece today to share with you what it is we do, why it is we do it, and how we feel that it relates to the subjects that we're going to be addressing here on Tusoka. had some type of week. This was kind of like a career high. (laughs) Yeah, it was. Um, It was a great week. On Wednesday of this week, we, my agency and I conducted our very first racial justice conference. I was there. She was there uh, front row supporting me the whole way. And it was really a wonderful opportunity to get people of like mind together to talk about systemic racism and and what we can do together to eradicate this in the different systems that have been built into our society for so long. Yeah, it it really was great. I mean, I learned some new stuff, met some interesting people. I was happy to be there. Yeah, for sure. It was um it was culmination of about 2 years of work to get to that place and when it happened and when it happened so genuinely and with authenticity you know it was it was just a wonderful day I was really very proud of the work that we had done to get to where we were I was proud of you too ah thanks Candy so we want to talk about um the type of work that we do Judy you want to go all right uh So as you know, I'm a marriage and family therapist. I have been working in this field for about the last seven, eight years now. And I came to this a little bit later in life. I started in my working career more in administrative positions, executive assistant, project manager, so on and so forth. And while I did have some very positive experiences. I also had some kind of negative experiences in that field. And it dawned on me at some point, much later on, that I was not feeling fulfilled. You know, Candy, our parents taught us to be of service to others. True. And I just wasn't doing that. Yeah, yeah. And so I wanted to find something that would bring me that sense of fulfillment. But I really didn't know it what that was. Do you know when I figured it out, Candy? When? So my husband, Rick, he was the one who actually said, you know what, you should be a therapist. And it was not until that moment that it really made sense for me. And it felt real. It felt like, yes, this is where I should be. Have you ever had that sort of feeling? Oh, definitely. Definitely. I'll share my experience with that. So what happened was um, I applied to another graduate program, and I remember the application process, getting letters of reference. I remember when I was accepted and how I wept openly because it felt so very real. I was going back to school, mother of three, heading back to school. And that was rather daunting. I don't know why you were surprised that you got accepted. I remember when you were crying. I'm like, wait, it, it's in my brain. It was a foregone conclusion. <laughs> well, well, you know, sometimes you don't trust yourself the way other people trust you yeah. um, or believe in you. So it took me a minute. But once I got back into school, it was where I was supposed to be. I had a wonderful cohort And I learned so much in those two years, every Saturday for nine hours, missing soccer games, missing play dates, but I was so very committed. And the beautiful thing is that my husband and my kids recognized my commitment and supported me the entire way. Yeah, that's a great thing to have. Yeah. And then, you know, on graduation, when 
my whole family shows up. Family friends from Jamaica came to my graduation. Yeah, we travel deep, people. <laughs> yes, we do. And so it really, it really was this moment for not just me, but for everybody who had supported me. And to do the work that I do, I feel incredibly blessed every day because I know that I am making a difference, not only in the lives of my individual clients, but dare I say it, to the world. Mm -hmm. Going back to the conference last week, I got to stand up and talk about our need to move beyond racist behaviors and to come together. And I know that that has a ripple effect um, and can impact a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. So as a marriage and family therapist, I have the um, great luxury of, of meeting with clients one-on-one, -on -one, um, helping them move through hurdles, challenges that they might have in their lives with their families, individually, with their careers, and really to help provide some support, some guidance. And every now and then I might drop in a suggestion or two, but really it's a place for them to unburden themselves and to share what's on their hearts and minds. And then I'm able to work with that to, to maybe show them a new path or to provide a new perspective, a new opinion that helps them to move forward. What do you think is the most gratifying thing? Like, you know, when you think about like a happy thought when you're going to bed and you're like, today was a good day. What's something that you can think of? So I've had a number of clients that were, you know, it, they were difficult. Um, adolescent clients who might have been suffering from depression, suicidal ideation, um, anxiety. And when I see that I can be a support to them and I can change, help to change the path of a young person's life where they can feel more, more self-worth, mm -hmm. more confidence, more empowered to be the person that they're supposed to be, that brings me joy. That goes back to the, the fulfillment that I had been lacking for so long. Yeah, I, I completely relate. And you know, the funny thing is, even though Judy and I have completely different careers, um, Lots of time, the end goal is the same. Um, my career path, um, I, I knew I wanted to be a doctor when I was eight years old. I went to medical school, became a p pediatrician, and I was a practicing pediatrician for about nine years. And um, it was a lot of cough, cold, constipation, and congestion. And it became rote, and I had kind of the same kind of rehearsed answer. Your child does not need antibiotics. This is a viral infection. You need time, drink a lot of fluids, and rest, and your child will become better. And I grew frustrated because I was repeating that same mantra every year to the same people. And the only time I became excited was when, sadly, I would diagnose something unfortunate, like, oh my gosh, renal disease, your child needs a kidney transplant, or, um, you know, something that's life-changing for the child. So maybe around 2005 or so, um, I was 38, 39, I decided to pursue a fellowship in child abuse medicine. So... <clears throat> I interviewed at a few places, and most of the places were out east. I didn't go there because I don't like the cold weather. So I interviewed in San Diego and New Orleans, and then oh, it was 2005 because Katrina hit. Hmm. And I had been accepted to a program, and then it got washed away. And then there was none really in California so I actually interviewed for a position in Oklahoma, and I liked it. We moved there, did my fellowship, and I turned 40 that year. And so I've been doing this for about 16 years now, and my fellowship is in child abuse medicine. At the time, uh, there weren't that many child abuse docs in the country, and I got to take the boards. What year was it? Was that 2007? 
So I'm, I think, the 64th person board certified in child abuse medicine in the country. And in my current capacity, I take care of kids with allegations of child abuse and neglect. And I'm also the medical director of um, the sexual assault um, team at the hospital. Every day is different at work, and you have a real sense of satisfaction uh, giving a voice to the kids who have no voice and um, helping to alleviate um, pain in a family. And then, you know, very much like you, my organization, we're a team. So we help to build up families. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not, I'm not here to take away kids from families. No. I am, I'm here to make sure that children are in healthy homes where they can thrive. Now, what someone considers family may not be what I consider family, but it's it's their family. And I really can't impose what I feel on the on these families. And my greatest joy in uh, the work that I do is um, when I ch have a child come to the office being evaluated for child abuse. And uh, the office is so welcoming with a playroom. And we're so playful. And we're so uh, child focused that the child has no idea that they were evaluated for child abuse. And sometimes kids cry because they don't want to leave the office. Mm -hmm. We frequently get comments that the entire staff is loving and supporting. And that gives me a great deal of satisfaction. In addition, I work with colleagues and we're all like minded. Um, but we we bring something different to the table, each of us. And I think that's what makes a great team. And um, that's why I love my job. I really can't see retiring. I don't know, like doctors usually don't retire, but I'll probably be seeing patients like till the day I die. And it's because the work is so important and so very much needed. And, you know, as Candy's talking about this, I'm thinking back to um, a time where I would have a client. I remember one client in particular who was horribly physically and emotionally abused by her mother. I'm not going to lie. I had a really hard time with it. I think I went home after that very first session and just cried um, because of the horrors that this young lady had had to endure. But I called my sister and I said, okay, I need some help with this. If nothing else, to vent to someone who understood, and yet from a very different perspective. I could talk to my colleagues about what I had heard from a therapeutic perspective, but it's, it's so great to be able to talk to you about these things and get the medical side of it. So I can present the mental health, you provide the medical side, and it's really helped me to kind of conceptualize a lot of my clients, a lot of my cases, um, and to consider the physical manifestation of all of these things. So, uh, you know, I just think we make a great team to Soka. Yeah, truly. And, you know, and the thing about the work that we do is you have a team at your office. I have a team at my office. You used to go into people's homes and I need to talk to social workers to figure out what's the home like. And um, I tell people it's like a puzzle. You ever do a puzzle and one piece is missing mm -hmm. and there's no satisfaction and it doesn't matter how small, but it needs to be there. And that's why working together as a team is so important in, in my work and also in your work. So, you know, Judy and I, well, I guess it's my joke. My joke is that Judy has been copying off of me <laughs> yes. her entire Yeah, she life. likes to say this a lot. And it's true. It's not. It's, it's so true. Okay, we have three kids. Listen to this, you guys. My first child is born December 17th. Her first child is born December 18th. My second child is born September 3rd. Her second child is born September 2nd. It's only until she had the third child that she decided to fly solo and not copy off hey, of me. Hey, I cannot fault us from having the same fertility cycle. Come anyway, on. 
Anyway, so I did a second career in my 40s, and she did a second career. The funny thing is, we're kind of doing very similar things. And I think it goes back to how we were raised. Absolutely. You know, it, it, it goes back to helping people and recognizing that there's nothing special about you, that everybody needs to be elevated. And I mean, I credit mommy and daddy with that for instilling that in us. So I, I... I tell people all the time that our parents really instilled that idea of being service to others. True. And that's what I do each and every day. I remember our father, who was a physician, his clients, his patients would come to him and they wouldn't have the money to pay for their visit. So they would bring him a cooked meal. Um, he would go to their homes and do house calls because he knew that this is how he needed to serve his patients. It wasn't about money for him. It wasn't about status. It was truly about being of service. Yeah. On the other hand, our mother would collect items, clothing items, household items, what have you, throughout our childhood and pack barrels, huge barrels that we would send back to Jamaica to the families in um, communities where maybe they didn't have the clothing they didn't have the household items but mommy and daddy always taught us to be of service to others that's very true it's funny you talk about the barrels because I remember when we were living in Jamaica we used to get barrels not that we were in need but we got luxuries I remember we'd get things from America like peanut butter And books and little clothes that our aunts used to send for us. But um, definitely being a service to others and not putting yourself above other people is what I think the take-home lesson from our our upbringing was. And our career choices. Yeah, exactly. I remember um, we would go back to Jamaica to visit and I would see some little girl or some, some little boy in the neighborhood and I'm thinking hey, wasn't that my dress? Yeah, yeah. And when daddy died, I saw a young woman who wore one of my dresses that I had sent back. And I mean, this is not like we're sending a barrel to just Jamaica. It's to the area where my parents grew up. So that's why, you know, we would have these kind of full circle moments. But I want to point out that when we might have noticed kids wearing our hand-me-downs, it wasn't, it wasn't, that you are any better or I'm any better than you. It was just our way of doing the little bit to give back to that community. And it made me feel good whenever I recognized something that a child was wearing that I had outgrown. And then mommy, she would collect the clothes and things. And then when she would pack it in the barrels, she would never just put it in the barrel. She would fold up a shirt, say, little boy can wear this when him go bush. (laughs) Little girl can wear this when she got church. Boy can um, go get him go out in these shoes. So she was always kind of attributing uh, an activity to the clothes uh, that she would send back. I mean, it, 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 was, it was such a nice ritual for me. And um, daddy, when he would go back to where he grew up, daddy would always have like a pocket full of cash. And he would, you know, see a young boy, come here, how you doing in school? And then, here, take this. And it would be some money. And, and, and take this for your mother. When my godfather died and we went to Jamaica, we went up country two times. So one week, daddy gave a boy money. Then we go up country the next time. And uh, daddy had given the boy money and told him to give money to his mother. So my brother says to him, you give the money to your mother. He said, no, me keep it. <laughs> so, um, but it, 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 it was, it was a great, it, it, it really was. So I think I want to impart that in my kids and I feel fulfilled that I'm living a life of service really to others. Absolutely. And one of the things, um, as a therapist, you work so, so hard for your clients, but you don't always see the end result, you know? It's you're hoping that you're planting the seeds, but you might never actually see the seed grow. And I have had occasions where I've seen the seeds grow. There was a time I went to my allergist for my, you know, my weekly shot and somebody hollered out to me and it was a previous client. When I tell you 
that this young lady went from serious depression, suicidal ideation, suicide attempts, to becoming a mother, having a full-time job, having her car, and having her own place with her child. You know, drop the mic. Yeah. Drop the mic. Yeah. That is what it's about. And the comment, Judy, you were always there for me. That's why I do what I do. I can't see anything after that. <laughs> And if you could see me now, you see that there are tears in my eyes because yeah. I can still see this young woman. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, getting up and moving your family and trying a new career at the age of 40 isn't easy. Um, some of the challenges I had, well, I had to sell my house. And back then that HGTV show was on. And I went online and I applied to be on Design to Sell and we got selected. And so we were on Design to Sell. And then after we fixed up the house, it uh, the house sold in six days for full asking price. And then we moved to Oklahoma. Um, we moved to a very family-oriented neighborhood. Uh, the bus stop was right in front of the house and we enrolled the kids in school and um, I had to, of course, take a huge salary cut from being, you know, a practicing pediatrician to being a fellow. But because Oklahoma has such a low cost of living, uh, we were able to do that. Mm -hmm. And um, I did the fellowship, stayed on, and I was working in the medical school and also doing child abuse medicine, but then took a huge salary cut and then had to leave. But, you know, the kids got acclimated uh, well to Oklahoma and did well in school. I will say that um, they did encounter some racism. Um, my daughter was called the little black girl by the bus driver. And thankfully, some of the kids stood up. And then um, my son, what happened... My son, and I know this sounds braggy, but I'm not bragging, but my kids were doing really well in school, and I would say, did you do your homework? Yeah, when did you do your homework? On the bus? And literally, the bus was five minutes away from the school, so I had to find a more challenging experience for them, and um, when I spoke with the administration at the school, they suggested that I skip Haley a grade, and she was already the youngest person in um in her grade so that you know wasn't the thing so I put the kids in prep school and um they said that they felt normal because they weren't singled out or belittled for doing well in school so that was and that was a lot of money to pay for on a fellow salary but that was one thing I did but you know in Oklahoma when you meet people within the first five minutes, where do you go to church? You want to come with me to church? And that was the first place I heard somebody say, oh, so-and-so, he's unchurched. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. And um, But it was a good experience, and I made really good friends mm -hmm. um, at the fellowship. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't easy, but it was definitely worth it. Right. And, you know, I think there are there are challenges when you make a big shift like that. We're not trying to say that it was easy for me to become a therapist. It was easy for my sister to move into this new aspect of medicine because there are challenges. Um, and I'm not going to lie, it's they can be really hard. Um, I remember starting school and having to do student loans. And there was a point after my first year of school that I actually left my corporate administrative job and was making all of $12 an hour on a part-time, barely MFT associate position and trying to make it financially. And, you know, thank God my husband was as incredibly supportive um, to help me through that. But it, it was no joke, it was a struggle. But we, I think, collectively, we recognized that the struggle was worth it. Yeah, definitely. Now, you had some personal struggles. Why don't you share that? <laughs> personal therapist struggles? Yeah. Okay, so um, 
one of my first jobs um, as a therapist, I was still an associate. I had to go into my clients' homes. That's what you're talking about? Mm Mm-hmm. So I had to go into my clients' homes, and you never know what you're going to encounter in people's homes. Their children need the support, but you still have no clue what you're walking into. Um, There was a case where um, a father used his rather menacing dog to intimidate me. I thought I was going to be killed and buried in the backyard. There was a time where, oh, the number of times that I've been exposed to bed bugs and scabies and then come home and strip down naked in my garage because I was fearful of bringing anything into my home. And probably the worst was when I was bitten by a dog the night before Thanksgiving. Now, I enter the family's home. The family knows me. The dog knows me. But the dog decided to bite me. But... In an effort not to shame my clients, I proceeded with the session. I did what I needed to do, but when I got out out of that session, Candy, I called you. Crying. Crying. crying, Saying, I am too too old old for for this this shit. shit. (laughs) (laughs) And I agreed with her. She was. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Um, But, you know, you pay your dues. Right. And you find a way to push through and to persevere and pray to God that you get that next promotion and the next promotion. And I'm lucky enough to be able to say that I did get those promotions and I no longer have to go into people's homes. But believe me, for our new therapist, I empathize. I know the struggle and the struggle is real. Yeah. But it's also a struggle that is worth it because you come out, come away from all of those experiences experiences with much greater understanding of your clients, greater empathy, and just a a better sense of who they are and what they have to go through on a regular basis. Right. Now you have a scabies story. I have a scabies story. Okay. So when I go in to see when I was just a general pediatrician, and when I would moonlight at night, you know, I would walk in the room and sometimes these kids would run up to me and, and, you know, hold up their arms and I'd pick them up and then I'd say so what's your child here for and then mom would say I think he has scabies oh and the kid would be in my arms and I'd like gingerly put the child down but thankfully I never got any infections from work so that was good but I think we we definitely have different struggles but I was I was not like in the trenches and thank God for Judy because if a dog bit me I think I would have probably kicked the dog <laughs> run out of the house screaming (laughs) and never come back yeah but I I I remember I remember sharing that story with the family and they and everybody kept saying you didn't say anything and I said no I can't shame my clients because if I then bit you but if I turned around and made them feel bad about it it would defeat the work that I was trying to do with the family oh you're good yeah you're good yeah yeah so um but, you know, the thing is, we can look back at all of these things and laugh. Yeah. And yeah. and recognize how far we've come. True. With these changes that we've made for ourselves. And at the end of the day, yeah, you know what? I didn't want to be bitten by a dog. I didn't want to be scared in someone's home. I didn't want to have those things happen to me. But it makes me a better therapist, having been through all of it. I don't need to be bitten to be a good doctor. <laughs> That, that, that's where I'm coming from. <laughs> All right. So my sister and I differ in some aspects <laughs> yeah, for <definitely>. sure. <laughs> so Candy, I just want to go ahead and wrap up our uh, session today Ooh, and up, just, girl. just talk about just thank you for sharing that again with me and for being able to think back to, you know, where we were, where we started, where we ended up, where we are today. Um, Because it has been a journey. And, you know, I know a lot of you out there are on your own journey. And you are trying to make decisions about your life. And believe me, regardless of the age, you can do it. I might have been one of the oldest people in my class in graduate school. But I was there for me. I wasn't there to compare myself to the younger students. I wasn't there to to 
accommodate anybody else. I was there for my own um, fulfillment and my purpose. And so I just want to recommend to all of you to search your heart and your soul for what it is you want to do. Don't let age stop you. You can do it. Have the support around you, whether it's family or friends or professors, whomever it might be, seek them out because they will provide you that level of support that you need when you do make a life change like this. But I think, you know, you just need to take the time to search your heart. And once you find that, it'll just make sense. The light bulb will go off for you. And hopefully it will be worth it because it has been for me. And it has been for me. So to all of you, we say thank you for joining uh, to Soka Conversations with a Therapist and a Doctor. And we look forward to seeing you on the next session. Like, follow, share, write us at tusokapodcast at gmail.com. Send questions and we will answer them on the air for you. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Candy. Bye. No Longer Network.